I got the last one. This is yours. Yeah. Let me do the vitamin C first. Can I have one? You know, the whole fucking bottle. <laughs> this should all go in the podcast. <laughs> Just this should be the intro? Yeah, I think so. Alright everybody, welcome to episode 3 of the Useless Podcast. I'm Mike Stout. I'm Tony Garcia. And since Mary's probably going to be figuring in this somehow. She's going to laugh, because we're hilarious. This is Mary Stout. Say hi Mary. Hi Mary. Wow. If we don't make Mary... a cheap joke. If we don't make Mary laugh, it's going to be a failure. Yeah, we're going to not release this episode if Mary doesn't laugh. She's already laughing, but she... She's trying to hold it in. We can't make her laugh so that you hear her, it won't count. Right. All right, we'll get so, there. Today's episode of the Useless Podcast is uh, going to be all about cheating in the player's favor, right, Tony? Quote unquote cheating. Quote unquote cheating, and uh, we came to this because last time we were talking about um, how you sort of came to understand the, the the difference between difficult and unfair, and I was wondering if you could just uh, go over a little bit about what what you had been. Yeah, I mean, Same. sort of what, what I was talking about was when I was first starting to make games, uh, to me, the number of times a player died trying to complete my levels was a badge of honor. Yes, so you wanted you wanted more death was more better, right? Right, that's okay. the way I saw it. It was my job to make it as difficult as possible for them to get through it so that when they did get through it, the sense of accomplishment would be sky high. Uh, not realizing that, that's actually a really simplistic view of what difficulty actually is. What? I, I know, right? Insane. That it's actually kind of complicated and doesn't just come down to... Making the player die? Right. Really? It seems that way. Yeah. It's what I've learned. Well, you're right. <laughs> so, I mean... It's like uh, an after-school special. You're right, Timmy. Well, here's something that I think a lot of people who, who don't make games or uh, or even like run a, a role-playing game at the table right they don't get how easy it is to kill people right like it is completely trivial to make something that will kill you right what it isn't trivial to do is to make something fair right that will kill you well you when we were talking about this off camera as we do from time to time tony this whole thing is off camera <laughs> You mean off mic? Off mic. I'll start over. All right. As we were talking about before we do this, off mic. Thank you. As we do this from time to time, uh, you were saying that a lot of people think the opposite of hard is easy. Yes, but it's not. Right. The opposite of hard is unfair. Right. Yes. Hard is a good thing, and unfair is the bad thing. Right. Right. And the, the opposite of easy isn't necessarily a good thing either. It's not hard. The opposite of easy is every day is your birthday, which we'll talk about later. That's on. right. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so the given, given what Tony just said, uh, we thought it would be interesting to talk about how games that we've worked on in the past cheat in the player's favor to avoid being both unfair and to avoid it always being your birthday. And we're going to destroy uh, your opinion of how good you are at video games. <laughs> we may. I when I've had this discussion with other developers, that has happened before. Yeah. So people are just like, oh, I thought it was really good. <laughs> yeah. That that actually did happen. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, changing people's world. So the first topic I have here on my little beat sheet is quote randomness unquote. And you you specifically said that I should put it in quotes. So tell me about that. So the idea is that. There's a lot of things in games that seem random. Right, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of things that seem like they come down to a coin flip that it could... something. Uh, one fight that we were talking about, this, this has been coming up a lot recently. I've been playing a lot of World of Warcraft. Uh, and there's a boss fight in the newest World of Warcraft raid. Mary's playing World of Warcraft right now. That's right. Not, not what I'm talking about, because she's a casual and doesn't, yeah, doesn't yeah. do the hard stuff. Oh, oh see, there we go. Uh, uh. Casual. Um, there's a boss fight where uh, these mushrooms sprout up from the ground randomly 
around the boss arena. Okay. And when you walk in, when we first started fighting the boss, it seemed very clear that the bo- mushrooms could appear at random places throughout the boss. But as we do the fight more and more, we realize that there's, there's not a true randomness to it. Like, they do make... they There does at least appear to be something in the background that's making it so those mushrooms are not going to appear in a place that will completely screw you over. <laughs> yes, there's the... There's a lot of that that goes like uh, arena systems in Ratchet, for example, or just a lot of attention that goes into making sure that the random number generator won't completely fuck you. Right. Uh, we had that, we were actually talking about a friend who. Uh, this is a less obvious example, less a prominent example, but who worked on a game that had randomly generated maps, and they had to put in code to make sure that those maps <laughs> were not drawn in an offensive manner. Like, for example, a swastika. Like a swastika. They had to have swastika detection <laughs> algorithm. Right. And that, that doesn't necessarily have a big impact on gameplay, but it's an example of pure randomness is rarely what you want. And it's rarely what you actually get when you're playing a video game. Things that seem purely random are almost never purely random. Right. Because pure randomness doesn't feel that good. Right. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and that's why we put randomness in quotes right. for this section. All right? randomness sort of happens within a range where it feels slightly different when you go through it, but it's all very controlled to make sure that the player experience is what we want it to be. A good example of that would be uh, if you think about uh, arena bosses in Ratchet and Clank, right? Uh, they would have this attack where missiles would rain down from the sky and hit reticles around you. It seems like those reticle placements are completely random. They're not. It's like uh, three of them will be aimed at the player and the rest will be arranged in such a way that they can't screw you over. Right, right? absolutely. And they're, they, it comes across as very random because the situation is very chaotic, but they're actually very deliberately set up so that you don't, at least not often, get screwed over by it. Right. Uh, so that if you fail, you fail because it's your fault. Mary just passed us a note. We just have a note. Does pure randomness not feel good? But why not? Because oh, guys why said, does pure randomness not you, feel you, good? You guys said that, and I was like, but why? That's a good question, Mary. And I'm glad that you could ask that to us. That actually, <laughs> that actually will help the quality of our new program. Uh, pure randomness is bad because I'll give you a concrete example. Right? Let's say you were playing Super Mario Brothers, and they generated the level randomly before you you went in. There's a chance you might not be able to make it to the end because it might be blocked. All right. Let's say you take that that element out of randomness. Right. Now there's a chance that there might just be 15 Goombas right in a row, which is a doable situation, but aesthetically it's not the thing that you want. Right. So you make it so the Goombas all have to be spaced out by one space, and something goes in between them. Well, now you get areas where there's a ton of them all looking the same. And that sucks because you don't want them to have to do the same thing they did before. So then you start trying. You see how quickly you start shaping the randomness to mean what you want it to mean. One of the things that, um, so one of the things we talked about was uh, to bring back an example of WoW. There's a lot of stuff that comes down to a coin flip of whether you get it or you don't based on a coin flip. And the reality is, even though there's a 50-50 chance. There's a guy out there who is going to go on the craziest bad luck streak of his life and fail 500 times in a row. Yes. And that feels horrible. Yes. You need to put something in there to prevent them from failing 500 times in a row. Because in a truly random system, the the freakish streaks do happen, especially if you use it long enough. The thing is, one thing that was brought to my attention that was very funny is uh, Ratchet and Clank sold, not to toot my own horn here, or our own horn here. Yeah. Ratchet and Clank sold millions of copies. Yes. Like millions, millions and, million. and millions. If there was something in the game that was only a one in a million chance of happening, it was going to happen to multiple people. Yeah. Statistically. <laughs> one in a million chance means it's going to happen. Yeah. That's true. It, that, that's, that's not an acceptable risk. At that right. Point. Yeah. So even, even if something is very, 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 very improbable... You have to take into account, do you want this to happen even and, though it's improbable? And do you want to risk that when it happens, it happens to a reviewer? Right, absolutely. Is the other thing, right? Because if, if the wrong person happens to get that streak, your whole 
You know, if that's and if if that streak of bad luck is the first thing that happens to someone, they might just say fuck this and go, and go play something else. Right. right. So real randomness is not always that desirable for that reason. Right. I mean, there's also this the effect of people remember the bad streaks more than they remember the good streaks. That's true. You get a brief high for the good streak and you get a long remember remember right. the bad streak. So you really have to make pick a lot of work into making sure that they and this leads into the our next, next topic, topic of of hard versus unfair. Yes. Getting screwed by bad luck is unfair. Yeah. It's not hard. It sucks. And that's the thing about difficulty that when people say this game was too hard, that what they mean is this game was unfair. Right. What someone really wants is for the game to be the perfect level of hard for that individual person the whole time that they play the game. And this is where we reveal that you are not as good at games as you think you are. No, because every game, every game is behind the scenes trying to help you. Right. Trying to make sure that these ra- these streaks of uncontrolled randomness. Lays. If you play Settlers of Catan, it's how when you place on an eight, only the sixes get rolled. And when you place on a six, only the fucking eights get rolled. Like, always, right? That happens to one person every game. And y- you can mitigate that and mitigate how awful of an experience someone will have, then yes, you're going to do that. Right. Uh, it would be irresponsible, in fact, of you not to do that. And this leads into the act tuning systems. Yes. That you have a lot more experience on it in terms of... I, in terms of, There's so much stuff that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that the player has a consistently... Excellent. Uh, excellent experience yeah. throughout. Right. And we don't have any crazy spikes in difficulty where you just get roadblocked. Those systems are critical... And they've been in every game that I've ever worked on, and they've been done well in every game I've ever worked on that's gotten really highly rated. And, and sold still well. surprisingly contentious. And, yes, yeah, surprisingly contentious, but even before that, it's, it's a system that a lot of work goes into that no one will ever know is there. Right. Because if it's working well, you don't know it's there, and that's the point. So a developer will never come in, out and, and say, except maybe in the case of like Left 4 Dead, where they're trying to orchestrate the experience, right? Won't come out and say, yes, here's the thing that we did to make you feel more awesome than you are, because no player wants to hear that they're not. So awesome what kind of acting systems do you have a lot? Of, do you have experience for? What, what kind of stuff do you push for when you're sort of? And when we say acting, we're talking about dynamic difficulty tuning. Yes, we called it act tuning because that's what it was called at Insomniac when we first started. Hearing about right, but the, what we're actually ACT talking about ACT st- stood for something. I can't remember. Yeah, automated control. Something. I don't, I don't know. But uh, it basically, the, what we're talking about is a game that will dynamically sense how well or poorly you're doing. Yes, good streaks of luck, bad streaks of luck, whatever, and adjust the difficulty of the rest of the game accordingly, so that you don't get roadblocked or frustrated at certain points when things start to get difficult. Now let me jump in with the first thing that everybody says at this point, right? Is, well, hold on there a second, Mike. I've seen dynamic difficulty tuning systems and they suck. And yes, you've seen them. That's why (laughs) they sucked, right? So uh, an example is you die three times and then the next time you have an extra life, right? Like, or uh, uh, in a car game, every time you crash, everybody else goes a little slower and you notice it, right? That's that's not what we're talking about, right? That is a very clumsy execution of what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a system that tunes the future based on how you're performing in the present, right? Uh, I always like to call it intensity tuning because difficulty is such a contentious word on this. The, the thing that I've seen that works the best is when you have a system that tracks how the player's doing uh, in real time, and then whenever you have a good break where the game is supposed to get harder or different in difficulty, the game says, okay, based on how they've been doing, I'm going to set the difficulty of this next future section and set it in stone and it'll never change again, right? Unless some other crap happens, right? But generally, that gets set. You don't know it's there because you only went in once and then it got locked forever, right? Right. now, normally when I pitch this, it's very, I get a lot of pushback from people on it. I mean, I'm sure you've seen this before, too, where instinctively people get this idea that it's unfair. Well, I think a lot of people feel, I mean, the, the reasonable 
way to approach this is if the player ever found out, they would feel terrible. Yes. Which is true. And that's why there's a lot of stuff where when you get that dialogue message that says, you suck, would you like to just skip to, this? Would you like to go to easy? Yeah. Then you feel like, oh, this is really bad. Yeah. But to do it well is when it's all behind the scenes. And Ratchet had this, and a lot of people are surprised to hear that Ratchet had it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, there was one time I was, ta- I was talking with a game developer. I was trying to pitch doing this kind of dynamic difficulty tuning system. And he said, but I loved how in Ratchet it always was just your skill going for you. And I broke it to him that I'm talking about exactly the same system that we used in Ratchet, just with all the improvements that I've made over the years. And he just looked at me like there was no Santa Claus. (laughs) And he said, I thought I was really good at that game. And I'm like, you might have been really good at that game. There's just like, it tuned itself to be as hard as you needed it to be. Right. Right, and what I tell people is, um, difficulty is a very personal thing, right? For a, a, a game that is difficult for me might be easy for Tony, it might be trivial for somebody else, but might be incredibly difficult for my grandmother, right? Uh, as a game developer, what you want is not to make a section of your game universally hard, right? Like like a, like an obstacle course, right? You want to make it X amount harder than this other part of the game, right? So that you can say, all right, it starts off at like a one, then it goes two, three, then we drop it down to two, right? Because you want to keep the experience changing as you go through. That all falls apart the moment that your player is not as capable as you think they are, right? They might be disabled, they might just not be very good, they might not play very many games, they might not be, right? So once you realize this and you, you, you start thinking about it in terms of intensity, right? I don't want to make this necessarily more difficult. I want to make it feel more intense to play through, right? I remember one game that I was working on that everybody was exceedingly proud because there was one section of the game that was actually quite difficult. It ramped up the difficulty pretty high. But everybody was very proud because no matter who was playing, no matter how good you were at the game, whenever somebody got to that segment, on average, everybody died the same amount of times. Right. Which is what you want. Which is what, it, what you want. Every, you want everybody to have sort of the same experience. Nobody went through it and just coasted through it. Nobody was unable to beat it. Everybody, when it all was said and done, had like five deaths in the in the hard section of the game, but they all had the same level of experience. It was as, it was as difficult as it needed to be for everybody. Individually. Individually. Subjectively. Right. Yeah. Abs- and... And that was the, that was the success. The success wasn't that one player died four hundred times, and yeah, this is really hard. No, the success was that everybody got through it, but it was difficult for everybody, regardless. That's the real challenge. That's what you yeah. want to shoot for. That's as a as, if you're trying to author an experience, which isn't always what you're trying to do when you're making a game, but a lot of the time you're trying to author an experience. That's a subjective thing. You want to make that person subjectively feel that this part of the game is harder than the last part or whatever. Uh, and so many I mean so many games are about making the player feel feel powerful yeah and making the f- player feel like they're achieving something and when you go too far you rob that reward from the player and then they don't have the proper feedback loop when it comes to playing your game this actually makes a really good transition to the next part of the talk which is the other side of the coin uh, when people say it's too easy, they don't actually mean it's too easy because parts of the game should be easy and right. parts of it should be hard subjectively. The problem is the opposite of easy is every day is your birthday. Right. And if every day is your birthday, no day is your birthday. Right. You don't have a birthday anymore. It just gets boring. Yeah. After a while. You just, I mean, and that's what it comes down to. When things are excessively easy, it's just because. You're at, you're always so powerful that you have to go to this crazy level to actually make the player feel powerful. Like you have to have points where you dial it back a little bit and take something away from the player to make them feel special in the moments they're supposed to feel special. If it's always dialed up to 11, 11 becomes the new 5. Right. That's what I always tell people in user tests is you don't want it to be at 11 the whole time. You want it to be at 5, 6, 7, 8. Five, you know, right, right, right. You want it to be a nice little curve, uh, 
And uh, uh, any time, like if if you're if you're listening to this and you're saying to yourself, man. These guys think that all games should be easy. That's not what we're saying, right? Because the thing that you hate when you say all when you say easy is bad is what we're calling every day is your birthday. And we hate it too. Right, right? absolutely. Because because what we think is that a game at any given point during the game should be subjectively the difficulty that it's intended to be. That's it, right? And so we use these sort of behind the scenes systems to do that. Right. Uh, and do you want to specifically talk about any of them? Well, I was just I was about to add that the thing about games that's very unique about making games is more so than any other form of media, it's an interactive experience. It's like watching a movie is passive. Everybody can get to the end of a movie. Everybody can get to the end of a book. You know, in a game, you have to work to get to the end of the game. Yeah. And why would you make a game where your audience can't get to the end. It would be like making a movie that was designed to have people walk out in the middle. Right? right. Like that might be desirable for one movie where they were making that point, but it's certainly not desirable for the other 99.9999%, right? Right. And in games, generally, that you're not generally trying to make a game to make people stop playing it. Right. Unless it's global thermonuclear war. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Which is the exception that proves the rule. Right. And so that's, and that's what these systems are about. It's about... It's not about making things easy. It's about letting people experience what they paid for. Yeah. Everybody has a right to experience the game that they bought. And we're just trying to put in systems that make it fun for everybody to do that. I remember the first time I was really exposed to the dynamic difficulty tuning as a, as a decision, right? Uh, it wasn't in the game. And every uh, and everybody didn't want it in the game, including me. This was before, right? And we were all fighting against it, and one person was fighting for it, and they got their way, right? The system was put in so reluctantly. We we were so mad that the system was going in because we thought this is so unfair. It's going to make the game feel horrible. Why are we wasting our time on this, right? I went to the user test, and the user test was several days long, right? And when we got to the end. Everybody finished the game in almost exactly the same amount of time. They all finished within 30 minutes of each other. And when they, when they filled out their surveys, they all rated the difficulty of certain sections exactly the same. Despite the fact that the better players died dozens and dozens of more times than the other players did. They all thought it was exactly the right difficulty, or at least exactly the same difficulty, for every section. And so we could dial every part of the game in to be as difficult subjectively as we wanted to. The shitty players would have the exact same experience. And as soon as I saw that, why would I ever make a game that didn't have that? Right. Because it's it, it's so powerful and so perfect for getting across exactly what you need to. Now sometimes when you're making a game, that won't be what you want. And we're not saying that if you don't do it, you're wrong. Right. Not every game has to be like this. Yeah. But, but at the is... same time, you shouldn't be opposed to the idea. You should know what these tools are used for and have these tools available for you if it's right for the situation. Yes. And in the case where you're trying to make a game for a really wide audience, it's almost always the right situation, which is why we made the case early on in the podcast that it is done so frequently. Right. right, Because generally games are enough of a risk that you want to market it to as wide an audience as you can. And so you put that in right, to, to try to help. There's a, there's a phrase uh, Mike and I use that I imagine we're going to be using a lot in future episodes uh, that we call cargo cult game design. Yes. Where some people feel that if you have a feature, it's a generally accepted good feature, just put it in. When right. in reality, you have to look at the what the what you actually get from the feature, and then decide which parts which parts it. go in. And difficult tuning is one of those things. It's not great in all cases, but it's good in a lot of them. Yeah. And you shouldn't just discount it because oh, it's going to be unfair. It's going to make the players feel bad. You need to know what, and that's the whole point of the series, you know, that we're talking about is knowing what tools are available to you and using them in the appropriate places to enhance the experience. And to give you, if you're, if you're not a game maker and you're, you're a, a game player, to give you an idea of what development on these things is actually like. The things that we think about 
when we're making these games and why they feel the way that they do. So, uh, I mean, do you have anything else you want to say on this? Yeah, we were, one thing that we were also talking about going in was sort of just uh, how different difficulty, how different balancing multiplayer is versus a single player experience. Yes. And the, yeah. the particular pitfalls that come in from balanced multi, uh, multiplayer experience. Um, one thing that we talked about is that one of the, one of the friends I one of the people I used to work with uh, worked on a fighting game, and whenever they would take it into focus tests, there would be this character that was completely broken and overpowered, and they would go into there and they would do the focus test, and everybody loved them. Everybody loved playing as that character, and they would suggest ideas to make them even stronger. Like, wouldn't it be amazing if we could do this and two and a, and then they would sit down and be like, okay, that's great. But now think about how it would feel to have that done to you. And everybody would be like, oh, that doesn't sound very fun. And I'm like, yeah, it doesn't sound very fun. It's a whole other set of concerns that you have to worry about when you're, when you're balancing right, not, what's fair in multiplayer versus what's fair in a single player game. If somebody's feeling like a badass at the expense of another player, that's a, completely, that's a problem that's completely unique to a multiplayer game, right? And is solved completely differently. And everything that we've just talked about doesn't really apply right. in a multiplayer situation. That could probably be a whole podcast. Right. But it's the same thing where that where unfairness can definitely creep into a multiplayer game. When you can when something happens to you and you feel like, well, there's nothing I could have done. That's just how it is. That feels bad. You always want to have the idea that there's something you could have done to and as long as the player feels that way, then you're on your way to having something that feels balanced and fun. And fair, yeah. and that's sort of what we're. And that's, I mean, that's the key takeaway. That's the line we're here. trying to draw, right? Is, right. Is the opposite of hard is not easy; it's unfair. Right. And the opposite of easy isn't hard; it's stupid. <laughs> uh, there, there was one other thing I wanted to bring up. Was I, I had a couple examples of how this is used in games, not behind the players' backs, and how even then, this sort of cheating in their favor helps them out. Okay. So one example is, uh, I think it was Uncharted 2 that I was playing. Uh, they have a feature where uh, if you zoom the gun in that you're shooting, it will target the gun right at their midsection, right? So that if you're having trouble aiming, free aiming, if you can get it generally in their area and push the button, you'll get a couple free shots on them, right? But I noticed that when I switched the game into medium, instead of targeting the mid center, it would target their head. Right, so you would just get a headshot, and so when you switch the game into easy, all of a sudden you were a headshotting badass, <laughs> right? And you're just like, yeah, Nathan Drake just going through, boom, boom, boom. I'm James fucking Bond, right? And the thing is, is when you select easy instead of medium, that's sort of what you're looking for is the expect of the experience of what a player playing it super skillfully would feel, right? So I thought that was a really good example of the game cheating. On the player's behalf. Right. Rather than sort of dumbing it down for you, yeah. they made you feel better. Yeah. As opposed to making you feel like you were fighting a bunch of mindless drones who weren't putting up a fight. And then the... Yeah, because the other alternative would have been to just make them all easy or to uh, throw more of them at you if, if you're in hard mode or to make them have more hit points, right? They chose to instead make it feel better in easy mode and make the game easier, you know? Uh, the other game I thought did it really well like that was Bayonetta 1. I don't know about Bayonetta 2, I haven't played it yet. But uh, if you selected easy or very easy, um, they, you would get an item. And the effect of that item was every time you screwed up dialing in a combo, it did an awesome combo. <laughs> right? And that is uh, uh, dumbing things down, right? Because you don't have to dial the combos anymore. But if you think about what it's doing functionally, it's taking, it's taking someone who has gone into the game saying, I want this to be a cakewalk because I, I selected very easy, right? But I don't want it to be stupid. I don't want it to be every day is my birthday, right? So I'm trying to do the things. And then when I fail, instead of feeling like an idiot and then feeling bad that I picked easy and I'm still an idiot, I dial it wrong and all of a sudden, like... A boot made out of her hair comes out of hell <laughs> and just eviscerates them into the sky, right? Like, it's it's a it's 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 a clever way of changing the player's experience. So anyway, the point that I was making with that 
was uh, we, we gave a lot of examples of games that in the background sneakily try to cheat in your favor. Uh, but those are also a couple examples of games that do it in the foreground, and it's very satisfying, right? And you can see how those two things that I talked about are different from a system that slows all the other cars down every time you die, or which uh, you know gives you an extra life, uh, you know, an extra chance to get hit when you die, or something like that, right? Th that's not what we're talking about, and we know you hate that because we hate it too. What we're talking about is is systems that try to help you hit that zone that the player is signing up for. I mean, this is one, I and mean, this is another one of the things that we're, we were talking about is that there's a different vocabulary among game developers than there is among people who just play games. Right. Yeah. It doesn't always mean the same thing. Right. And that's sort of what it, we're coming down to is that I know a lot of people say that they like Dark Souls or Demon Souls because it's hard, but that's not really getting at the reality of what's working in Dark Souls and Demons. It's so much more yes. complex than that. Yeah. When you look at it critically, there's so much more going on there besides, oh, it's hard, and I feel good because it's hard. What it is, is it is always consistently, subjectively difficult. Right. Like, that's the, that's the thing that's good about it. But saying that is not something you can put on the back of the box. <laughs> right? Like, right. It's not something that's easy. I mean, it just took us 30 minutes to try to explain why we think of it that way. You know, so it's not an easy thing to talk about. But it is the way that especially a lot of experienced developers think about difficulty in games. It's not just either hard or not hard. Right? It's what you were just talking it's about. about. I mean, it's about, it's about trying to evoke an emotion from the player. And doing what you need to do to get to there. It's like... It's the same thing with a novel or a movie. It's a work of art. Yeah. And you're trying to get something out of the player. And you're using all the tricks that you have to get the player to feel a certain way. And it doesn't... so many games. It doesn't lessen the reaction that came out. It just means that the game more skillfully executed its original intent. Right. I don't, I, I don't believe in judging games based on their difficulty. I believe in judging games about how they make me feel. Do they make me feel like I'm good at games? Well, then it succeeded. Yeah. Or is it making me feel like I don't know what I'm doing and I'm just sort of stumbling my way through and, you know, that doesn't feel good. And the, the best is when it makes me feel like the game is really hard, but I can still do it. Right. Because it's fair. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, that's, that's what you want. That's more important than the game being objectively hard. Yes. Unless, and again, we're not talking about anything multiplayer, right? Because then it is kind of important for it to be objectively a certain difficulty. Right. Because you're competing. But in a single player game, that is not important at all. What's important is that the player who is currently playing the game is feeling what you as the game developer want them to feel. Right. And maybe you want them to feel like garbage. That's your call. That's cool. If that's the game you're making, make that game. I want to see it. That's right. I probably won't play it, but I, I want to <laughs> see it. I'll watch people suffer through it on YouTube. But, uh, you know, like, uh, there's always room for every kind of game, games that break the rules or not. It's just really useful to know the rules before you break them so that you can break them right. Absolutely. Right? Like we were talking about with Shadow of Mordor, right? The design of the, uh, the orc system was something that normally wouldn't work out unless it was executed perfectly and they did it perfectly and that's that's it's hard to tell that you know? well it's funny when you talk about having to know the rules before you can break them because that's one of the things i hear a lot about art and you have a lot of artists who have an art style that's so stylized and so sort of not at all realistic but those artists if you ask them to draw something realistically they can do that excellently Yes. Because knowing the fundamentals is so key to being able to do your own thing. Yeah. Like, uh, if you're a carpenter, this is a really simple example, and you're building a chair, if you don't know anything about the way that the forces interact in using a chair, you're going to build a shitty chair, right? But if you know how the forces interact, if you know that it needs four legs and the, the thing and then the back, right, and it all needs to be supported this way, then you can start making awesome chairs, Right? That don't look like they're obeying the rules of physics, even though they are. Right? Or that might be more comfortable than ones that just are, you know, functional. So it's like, that's, that's what you need. You want to break the rules, but you want to break them right. 
And right. to do that, you need to know what they are. And what you're doing. And what you're doing. Right. So uh, I guess that's uh, more than we wanted to say uh, yeah. in this episode. So I'll sign I still on. hate the player. Yeah, the yeah, you still hate them? You can't stand them. I want them all to die. Even though you're cheating in their favor now? I do it, I do it again. So you hate the player but love their money. That's right. That's Absolutely. So for the useless podcast, I'm Mike Stout. And I am Tony Garcia. And he only wants your money. That sucks. Yes, please send me your money.